the theme that I actually wanted to talk about today was, was to connect, in a way, two things that are um, happening not just in the American region, but particularly in the American region uh, at the moment, basically. We're, going, we're on our way towards the Casper Hauser Festival, which will be in Columbia County in a small way, and, and of course, in a big way, I guess, uh, via internet, which is a, a new experience. Um, and I think this is a wonderful thing that we can, you know, be together with as many people as want to be there uh, via the internet. So that's the one thing that's happening. And the other thing that's, that's happening at, at the moment already is this uh, series of online talks about the calendar of the soul. So, um, and of course, you can you can listen to those talks in Chinese if you if you like, but uh, they are also in in English, and I know that a number of you have been listening already. So that that's also quite a an experiment and quite an adventure to um, work with the calendar of the soul with so many people all over the world, basically, in America and in China and in Spain, and I don't know where everybody comes from, Peru and Mexico and so on. And uh, uh, we've prepared this now already with two talks. And now from Easter, we'll be going through week for week through the whole of the calendar of the soul for a whole year. So this is going to be quite something. And that is actually what I wanted to uh, try to do today was to connect these two events to each other. The question of Kaspar Hauser and the question of the calendar of the soul. So we'll try to um, take a step there together. And I'm actually very pleased that this will be part of your association meeting and so central in the American region, because I, I think this has something to do with North America. And since the office has been open in, in Sultane and Deborah has been there and, and doing all sorts of work there and building things up, uh, since then so much has, has really uh, been able to come about and, and we've made contact to so many people that uh, I think this is something quite special. And therefore, I think that this, um, this way of looking at both themes at once uh, belongs also to the North American region. So let me start off by putting the question that Ellen Fried Pfeiffer actually had when he traveled in the car with Rudolf Steiner, and he asked him then, what was actually the task of Kaspar Hauser? And I'm sure most of you will remember this, that uh, Ernfried Pfeiffer, who himself came from Nuremberg, where Kaspar Hauser had appeared, and Rudolf Steiner, of course, knew that, and he knew that, um, that Pfeiffer was very particularly interested in the history, the story of Kaspar Hauser. And he said something that actually um, he'd otherwise not talked about. And he said one thing that I think is extremely important for an understanding of the being of Kaspar Hauser. He said there, if Kaspar Hauser had not lived and died the way he did, the contact between the earthly world, between human beings and the spirit would have been completely severed. Now, I mean, this is really huge. You can't really imagine anything more you know, bigger than this, really, that the contact to the spiritual world was obviously endangered. And I think also if we, if we look back to the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century also, we will see the dangers that were present 
for the human beings and their connection to the spirit. So we have, of course, this, um, let's say, the height of materialism in a way, certainly the height of natural science and all the inventions, discoveries, theories that were evolving around this time. Um, Karl Koenig often spoke about this time when Kaspar Hauser arrived on, well, arrived on earth as Kaspar Hauser, so to speak, in 1828, when he turned up in Nuremberg. It was such a particular time for various reasons, but one reason was that actually a huge step had been taken in, the, in a new understanding of the human being, not in the way that Rudolf Steiner wanted to understand the human being, but the way that natural science understands the human being. It was basically the birth of embryonic science, something that Karl Koenig was very involved in then later. It was still a new science when Karl Koenig studied embryology and became a researcher also in the um, Embryological Institute in Vienna. So there we already have these two biographies, Rudolf Steiner and Karl Koenig, very involved in the, uh, the themes of their time. The origin of the human being, that is what it's about actually. And Karl Koenig was looking for this origin of the human being when he turned to embryology at the University of Vienna. Of course, Rudolf Steiner was looking to the origins of the human being with anthroposophy. And now we hear that actually this origin of the human being in the spiritual world, the true home, so to speak, the true origin of the human being was threatened at that time in the 19th century. Threatened, of course, to a certain extent through the consciousness which was evolving about the human being, about natural science, about an understanding of, of the world. But also because there was a, a decline anyway in the connection to the spirit, which is quite extraordinary after, of course, uh, the idealists, particularly the, the German idealists, but also the American idealists, had been around for a while and, and uh, sort of um, attempted to form a new image of our world, image of the human being, and also to speak about the task of the human being in this world. And yet there was this great danger, obviously. So that's one thing we know about the task of Kaspar Hauser. There was a, a second thing that Rudolf Steiner was able to speak about. He said that actually the south of Germany, this corner where Germany um, uh, links on to Switzerland, the Lake of Constance, south of Baden, and then as far as Donach, should have been the home of new mysteries for our time. Now, of course, this became then the home of anthroposophy with the Goetheanum. And maybe it's good to remember also that we are now exactly 100 years after this home of anthroposophy in Donach, the Goetheanum, burnt down. 1922, 100 years ago was this, yeah, sudden, fairly sudden um, growth of resistance against anthroposophy. Where Rudolf Steiner actually said, 1922, if Hitler and his friends come to power in Germany, I will not be able to put my foot onto German soil again. Which was actually the case, of course. After 1922, he already began to finish his work in Germany and did not go back then. After two attempts on his life in 1922, 
during lectures by national socialists. So this is a very particular time we're living in now, and I think it's important to realize that, that light and darkness are so close together. Light and darkness in the case that during that time when the new spiritual science was evolving in Donach, there was so much resistance against this new spirit that in the end, the Goetheanum was burned down. And one of the last events in this Goetheanum building was actually the, the founding of the Christian community. So there we see very close together this light that was brought into the world by Rudolf Steiner. And on the other hand, how darkness actually greets it or tries to take hold of this new spirit and also to destroy it. So what was this meant to be in the south of Germany and, uh, and Switzerland? Rudolf Steiner spoke there about new grail mysteries, a new grail castle will be built in this corner of the world, in this part of Central Europe. And that could not take place. He hinted at the fact that actually Kaspar Hauser would be the new Grail King, should have become the new Grail King. And of course, this was prevented. So again, we see how light and darkness are right next to each other in that time, in the 19th century. And Kaspar Hauser was, in a way, severed from his own destiny, severed from this task of bringing a new form of grail kingdom into being, new mystery kingdom into Central Europe. So already we see that this uh, mission in a way was prevented. And yet, Rudolf Steiner speaks about this complete success in a way of Kaspar Hauser that he was able to uphold the connection of the human being to the spirit world. So this is something, of course, that we've been speaking about in the Kaspar Hauser festivals, and we will be continuing this uh, very soon in Columbia County. So, um, yes, last time we, we spoke about Kaspar Hauser and the Grail when we were in Columbia County, and this time we will be continuing this theme. Kaspar Hauser and the Apocalypse. So we see how light and darkness will come together in this theme. So these two very um, yeah, amazing themes that Rudolf Stein had spoken about, the, the failed destiny of Kaspar Hauser on the one hand, and at the same time he was able to uphold the connection to the spirit world. That is, I think, something quite amazing, and we, we certainly haven't yet found the way to understand that totally. But let's just remember the situation, the end of the 19th century in Central Europe, because something that people in, in Europe or also in Germany don't very often think about or don't know about, that there wasn't actually a German state at that time when Kaspar Hauser was around. It was the state of Baden, it was the state of Bavaria, but there was not a German state like there is now. It's actually one of the youngest countries in the European community. And uh, if you ask people over in Europe about that, they will, they will tell you, you know, Malta is probably the youngest country. It's not. Germany is the youngest country in the European community. So this was something which was evolving at that time. The, the German state, as it was to become, was involved in a very strong way, connected to the question of the future of Europe altogether. It was not a thought of a nationalistic state of Germany. That was not the question so much. It was a question of how the whole of Europe can unite for the future. And 
the state of Baden, where Kaspar Hauser was born, was actually quite in the center of this. It was a, an area of, of Middle Europe, which was actually very, um, or almost revolutionary, or one could say it was revolutionary because the only revolution which had taken place in Germany was around that time in Baden. And they were very interested in working together to find a new way into the future. So this question of Rudolf Steiner about a new grail kingdom is very connected to where Kaspar Hauser actually came from, the castle of Karlsruhe, where he was born in 1812. And we have to remember that the person who was in the center of the founding of the state of Germany, which was only 1871, this person was Bismarck. And I guess most of you heard the name of Bismarck before. He was born in 1815, so actually three years younger than Kaspar Hauser. So one has to think that these two personalities would have surely worked together instead of the Prussian state, actually where Bismarck came from, taking the front line, so to speak, or the front seat in the founding of the German state. So we have something really huge there, which um, actually I think would have changed world history completely if that were to have taken place. Kaspar Hauser himself would have been 58 years old in 1871. So that would have been, so to speak, the prime of his life. It would have been his most active phase of life, would have been exactly there where he would have been needed on this outer level of founding a new uh, priesthood kingdom or Grail Kingdom, if we like to call it that. But what he actually took on through this, and we can say out of the darkness, because he was locked into darkness for 12 years, it's still something that it's, it's so difficult to fathom that he was actually kept in solitary confinement for 12 years. And out of this darkness, now that is, almost the title of Carlo Pizza's Kaspar Hauser play, Out of the Night, Kaspar. Kaspar Hauser, not the Prince of Baden, but Kaspar Hauser is born out of this darkness, out of this solitude for something which should have been a social mission for world history. And now he's, um, yeah, he's actually nobody. He's just, a child, he stays a child the rest of his life in Nuremberg and in Ansbach. Doesn't become king or anything like that, but nevertheless is known as the child of Europe. The whole world knew about Kaspar Hauser at the latest in 1870, he was already being talked about in Russia and in America. This huge article that was printed in the Atlantic Monthly, 1871, interestingly enough, when the German state was founded, then Kaspar Hauser was reported about for the whole of America. And there we see this very, very difficult history of this child of Europe known across the world. It's interesting that although he actually did almost nothing on earth, he had no profession, he didn't become anything in that sense. And at the same time, he was known across the world. That was obviously a very strong presence of this individuality. So we can, we can ask, of course, of, of people today too, you know, how strong individuality can be, even if people are not able to become in the normal sense of the word, um, important citizens or doctors or professors or whatever, or maybe can't even speak. And yet people can carry 
a very strong mission for our time. And that is, I think, why Karl Koenig found it so important to name Kaspar Hauser as a sort of a guiding spirit also for Campil and the work of Campil, because this element of destiny was there. The, the way that destiny can shine out into the world apart from any outer setting or um, whatever, without being a king or an emperor or anything, still something can flow into the world which actually also changes world history. Now, just to dwell on these two questions uh, for a minute, um, one can ask what is the difference between a Grail King in Europe, affecting the whole of world history through his relatives and friends and through the person he was and could have become. What is the difference between that and Kaspar Hauser? The way we know about Kaspar Hauser influencing so many people across the world, still today influencing people through, through what? through being a human being. And obviously, if we understand Rudolf Steiner correctly, through the deed he was able to fulfill out of this destiny and out of this darkness of his time and darkness of his mission, of his destiny, his own personal destiny and world history we're going through this very dark time. So what is the difference? Well, one difference, I think, is that we have to say, if Kaspar Hauser, the Prince of Baden, would have become a Grail King and affected world politics, world history in that way, then of course, this would have been a very different setting than we have today. Because with all these questions, particularly the question of our connection to the spirit world, we are left completely free. And how free we are left, we can see every day and read in the newspaper every day, because People don't want to be connected to the spirit world. So just to see this, to see the darkness of our times, to see the hatred amongst peoples in our times, to see the suffering in our times, that is the biggest sign that actually we are completely left to freedom. Now, the birth of this new mission was not 1812. The birth of this new mission towards the spirit world was in 1828, when this child was found on the streets of Nuremberg. And people one by one began to experience something speaking out of the depths of this soul, not speaking in terms of thoughts or philosophy or politics or anything like that, but speaking directly out of the human being coming from the spirit world. That's what people experienced. They experienced the angel standing behind Kaspar Hauser and shining through this child being in a way that we can hardly imagine today, unless of course we look to a very small child. I have a great advantage at the moment because uh, my first grandchild is here for a visit. So, um, and he's just six months old. So there you can just look into the eyes of this child and you already experience the spirit world looking to you. And maybe also asking that question, how are you using your freedom today? Isn't that in a way something when one can experience when one 
has contact to very small children. Or when one experiences people who have been able to uphold this power of childhood into later life, because we know there are people who are able to hold on to this element of childhood. And through these people also, we have this strong experience, maybe it's the experience of, let's call it um, conscience. It's not consciousness necessarily, but something that has to do with conscience one can experience there. So 1828, this child of Europe appeared, the birth, so to speak, of this particular um, task. And I think it is very, very striking to realize that exactly 33 years after this birth of the task of the child of Europe, exactly 33 years later, this historic cycle of 33 years. Kaspar Hauser was already gone, he'd been murdered. But then, 1861, Rudolf Steiner was born. I'm sure that's not a coincidence that Rudolf Steiner appears in that moment to link on so exactly to this task that Kaspar Hauser was carrying as the child of our time. Really, we should call him the child of the world and not just the child of Europe. But at the time, Europe was a very important geographic place for the development of social life. The child of the world, I think, would be a very nice name for Kaspar Hauser now. And then we have this other child that was born in 1861. 33 years later. And there we find a science, a philosophy of the spirit. We find a way also to find our own connection to the spirit. So Rudolf Steiner was the one who continued this path of freedom from Kaspar Hauser in a very special way. There is nothing that forces us to go a path of anthroposophy. No, exactly the opposite. It's not easy to follow a path of anthroposophy. It's not easy to convince ourselves every day that we need to follow this path. We need to school ourselves. We need to train ourselves. We need to train our thoughts. We need to train also our deeds to fall into this path of freedom to the spirit. Now, I think it's also something which is uh, quite amazing to see. Rudolf Stein spoke so often about this uh, historic rhythm of 33 years. It is a reality that something which comes up as an impulse in history, as a, a deed in history, or maybe also just a, a thought or an impulse in history, that in 33 year cycles, this will again, so to speak, come to the surface, be available. And so it was with the life of Rudolf Steiner. That which Kaspar Hauser had let into the world in a completely free way, completely without self-assertance um, in any way. He never said of himself that he was anything but a child. And there we find Rudolf Steiner bringing thoughts, bringing science, bringing philosophy, bringing a way of life directly out of this path of freedom. Now, if we Take a look there at the birth, not just the birth in Nuremberg, but the actual birth of Kaspar Hauser in 1812. Then we see this kingdom of Kaspar, if one would like to call it in this way. That's a, a picture by Greg Tricker, by the way. He uh, 
Uh, one of his favorite pictures, he said, is called The Kingdom of Kaspar. And there he painted Kaspar as a spiritual being, not as an earthly being, because in a way, Kaspar said to us, his realm is not of this world. That is what the Christ being also made us aware of. The realm of the spirit is not of this earth. But that is the task, surely, of our freedom, to bring this realm of the Christ being, this realm of the spirit, to earth. And that was quite new for spiritual science with Rudolf Steiner, that actually social life, everyday life, tasks of practical life should be enhanced by the spirit. Spiritual practice was no longer something for just special personalities somewhere hiding in a cave or whatever, but it was something for, well, um, as one of the German artists said, the mystery centers of today are on the main station. So that was Joseph Beuys. Mysteries today are out in the open. They're out there for our freedom. If you don't want to see it, you don't need to, but it's there for everybody. Now this, this date of 1812, that was when this kingdom should have begun to be developed. That's when this child of Baden actually came to birth. And already the forces of darkness were, were looking for this child and couldn't find it for a while. It reminds us of the kings, of course, looking for the child. And what happened in the beginning of time when the kings were looking for this child and they found Herod, the child was murdered. Children were murdered to eradicate this child being of Christ. And so with Kaspar Hauser, the forces of darkness were looking for this child to destroy it, to destroy this mission. Now, again, I would like to remind you of this 33 year rhythm. And if we follow this 33 year rhythm from 1812, then of course, after three times, 33 and a third years to be exact, after 100 years, we have 1912. What happens in 1912 is something quite extraordinary because Rudolf Steiner was in Berlin and he was looking to start a very new social impulse out of, out of the spirit. He'd collected particularly artists around him and was going to form this very particular um, association of spiritual art and spiritual way of life in 1912. And we know this did not take place. People were not ready for it. People were not prepared. And so Rudolf Steiner did not take this. He left it. What did he do in 1912? Well, to cut a long story short, it would be very interesting to follow up more exactly, but just to uh, cut this a little bit shorter, we can see that out of this impulse for new social spiritual life in 1912, actually the calendar of the soul was created. And I do think that is quite an important connection because this new spiritual way of life could not be founded in that year. At least he could offer a path of spirit training, a path to the spirit, which we could take up in freedom or leave it. And of course, at that time, people didn't realize what Rudolf Steiner was giving them with the calendar of the soul. And so people didn't take it up. It was not taken up properly. 
And after a while, Rudolf Steiner actually didn't reprint it. He, he saw that the Theosophical Society, also afterwards the Anthroposophical Society, were just not ready for this new path to the spirit that he'd given. So he took it and gave it to the soldiers in the front lines. And this is, I think, something which is quite extraordinary. The depth of the path to the spirit that he gave with the kind of the soul was so important that he gave it to the soldiers, those who were losing their lives in the front lines, those who were so close, close to death, close to hatred, close to murder, close to darkness and needed at least once to see this path to the spirit, which belongs so importantly to our times, the times of the 20th and now also to the 21st century. And he said when he, when he printed the um, Calendar of the Soul for the soldiers, he made them aware that this was actually a path of feeling. So it's not necessarily a path where you have to think too much, but it's a path where you have to experience your connection to the world in a new way. In connecting to the world, to the seasons, we connect to the way the earth is connected to the cosmos. And so we begin to take this path in breathing with the world, with the spirit and soul of the world. If we breathe with this, with the festivals, with the weekly verses, then we begin ourselves to refound our connection to the cosmos, to the spirit. And it's quite amazing to, to see how Karl Koenig realized this so early on. Now, I realize we can't go into details there, but I have tried to put some of these thoughts into the preparatory talks for the calendar of the soul verses. And um, I'd just like to quote maybe Karl Koenig once there, because when he drew these pictures for the, for the verses of the calendar of the soul, um, he also said to study this calendar of the soul so deeply has meant for him to realize that it is a total work of art. It is something which belongs together as a work of art. And in such a way that one can speak of it as being architecture, spiritual architecture. And to discover this spiritual architecture actually means to put oneself onto the path through the planets, through the planetary spheres, through the cosmos to the spirit. And he said, actually, to that realm where the Christ being is waiting for us in the etheric realm. Now, if you like to take hold of the calendar of the soul, and I, I do hope you all have it on your shelves or look at it every day, I really hope you do, then you will see the way Rudolf Steiner wanted this book to be. He wanted a very special drawing on the front, and it's quite amazing. Do take another look at this drawing, because it's 12 stars, and you can see how in this little book of 52 verses, the soul is taken on a journey through the cosmos, through the gateway, so to speak, of these 12 stars towards the etheric space. So even in the creation of the little book, which Rudolf Steiner actually had printed then for everybody, not just for the soldiers, in the last days of his life, this is the legacy of the life of Rudolf Steiner in a way, the Goetheanum had burned down. And what he can give us very particularly is this path of the calendar of the soul. Now, 
of course, you've already <laughs> noticed what that has to do with this task of Kaspar Hauser. It is the task of Kaspar Hauser that Rudolf Steiner gave to us in this calendar of the soul. This very free path of feeling to the spirit, not a path of philosophy and science and thought and so on, but a path of feeling. That is something which was founded in a way by Kaspar Hauser through the few years he was able to live on earth. And Rudolf Steiner could take this up in such a, a, an amazing way to form this into 52 verses. And even more amazing that Karl Koenig was the one to experience this and to know that this was the path that had been given. And that is why this became basically the path of schooling for the whole of the Campion movement. This was something he gave to his closest friends and pupils and community members around him in the early days of Campion, really in the early days. As soon as he got back from the um, from internment camp from the Isle of Man, there he began to speak for the first time about the calendar of the soul and never ceased to speak of the calendar of the soul until his last days. And these pictures which he'd drawn on the Isle of Man, they disappeared for a long, long time. We do, we have them now, we've printed them now, we've, we're now offering them to anyone who would like to take them up as, a, as their own path of feeling, feeling recognition, feeling self-recognition. Understanding the human being through feeling is so important. So what did Karl Koenig actually draw with these pictures? Well, he, draw, he drew just this, the path from Easter out into the cosmos, through the planetary spheres, through the, through the cosmos, through the 12 stars, to the realm where the Christ being lives. And there, on this pathway, he shows how we reach the height of, well, let's say the height of the earth, of course, reach to the spirit in the time of St. John. There is this meeting of the earthly human being with the higher being of the human. And at the same time, of course, a meeting with the word of the world. Is that not the Christ being anyway, the Logos? With this pathway of the kind of the soul, we reach up to the Logos in the time of St. John. But not only that, but then we begin to bring this down to our daily work on earth. That is very particularly the time after St. John, after we've reached these heights of the sun, there we begin to bring this down. And so we see when we get as far as Christmas, for instance, it's not a question of celebrating a birth 2000 years ago. It's a question of celebrating the birth of something we have brought ourselves from this spiritual pathway to earthly life. What have we brought this year through St. John's, through this pathway from Easter to St. John, through the portal of Michaelmas, this questioning, this, um, yeah, the trials of Michaelmas into winter? We, what have we brought with us this year? Have we brought something new? Have we made progress? Have we developed something which we can actually celebrate as a new Christmas experience in wintertime. And there you'll find in the verses of the calendar of the soul, we will be speaking about these week for week during the whole coming year, how actually we are, uh, let's not say expected, but encouraged to bring this experience of the higher being in the end of the Logos into earthly social settings, particularly in the winter part of the year, and then 
leading up again to Easter. So again and again, we go through this pathway to the spirit. We are practicing what Kaspar Hauser had managed with his destiny, with his feeling being, not with his knowledge, not with his profession or whatever, not with his title. He was not the Prince of Baden, he was Kaspar Hauser. Out of this being human, out of this feeling level, he was able to save our connection to the spirit world. And now the question is on us. Are we willing to take this path every year again and again to reach to the heights of the spirit with the breath of the earth and return to earthly reality to bring spirit to the earth? We are asked, we are invited by the calendar of the soul to follow the footsteps of Kaspar Hauser. What should Karl Koenig do otherwise in his drawings for the calendar of the soul out of his inspiration than for St. John, this festival of the heights of the sun, the heights of the soul of the earth. For this festival, what should he do other than to draw the being of Kaspar Hauser? And that is what we see if we turn, I just have a little picture of it here to remind you, but you all know this picture anyway. So there we have, I think you can see it, yeah? The picture for St. John's Festival, picture number 12, of the calendar of the soul. There we have reached the heights, and the question is, can this connection, you see this wonderful, it's actually like a, a threefold cross in a way that we see here. Can we manage to not only reach the spirit, but also return to the earth with our feeling knowledge of the spirit? And if we do that, then we put ourselves in the place of Kaspar Hauser. We have nothing in our hands, so to speak. We will not be praised for all we can do. We, we won't uh, get a diploma for it, or we will not become emperor or president or anything. Um, but we will be, hopefully, human beings who've experienced the spirit path, bringing this message in the end of love to the earth, because this feeling path to the spirit is actually the path of the heart. And that is why when Karl Koenig wrote that inspiration also of the Christmas story, where we find Kaspar Hauser leaving the earth. It's almost like the ascension of Christ that he describes there. Kaspar Hauser being enveloped in a cloud and leaving us. And you remember the um, pictures we know of the ascension of Christ. We see the feet of Christ looking out of the cloud. There's something very particular we've been told about this. The free will of the human being has a sort of a, um, yeah, a first celebration in this ascension of Christ. But we are also left on our own. This is also a, a message of freedom, the ascension. And then Karl Koenig describes in the Christmas story that something is throbbing there where one knows that the heart of Kaspar Hauser is. So it's a, let's say, a, a, an image, a picture, a 
an inspiration that Karl Koenig had, this throbbing heart of Kaspar Hauser. But so it is, and so is the path of the calendar of the soul, reaching to the spirit and then bringing this spirit as well as we are able into our daily life. That is the path of Kaspar Hauser and also the sacrifice of Kaspar Hauser. It is a sacrifice to attempt to bring spirit experience into daily life because people won't necessarily understand it and people might not even want it and it could be that one is even persecuted because of it but at the same time it is something which is able to ray out as a pathway of love a pathway of the heart a pathway of Kaspar Hauser and that is why if we look at the calendar of the soul, we don't just find that this very particular, the highest point of the calendar of the soul, so to speak, this circle of the festivals, the highest point being St. John. We find there the being of Kaspar Hauser. And in bringing this to earth, in taking this sacrifice upon ourselves, bringing about a new meaning for Christmas, the birth of spirituality on earth in the darkest part of the year, bringing into the darkness of our times this light of the spirit. Just in this time, the calendar of the soul has seven verses where the heart is spoken to around Christmas. If you take a look at this, and this is my question that I also have put um, for this study of the kind of the soul that we are engaging now on for the coming year. The question is, what could possibly these seven verses have to do with this being of the individual? Because we also know the Gospel of St. John which is also the gospel of love, the gospel also of the individual human being. There we have also seven verses, not of the heart so much, but of the I am. We have seven I am words of Christ in St. John's gospel. And I think that these seven verses of the heart in the calendar of the soul have to do, on the one hand, with Kaspar Hauser, and on the other hand, with the St. John's impulse of spirit enlightening the darkness of our earthly space. So I think we shouldn't spend now too much time on details, but I, I would just like to say the reason why I was so keen on speaking about this for the association meeting was for various reasons. One reason being, of course, that we are going on this journey through the year with the calendar of the soul. But um, another thing is, I, I do think this has something to do with the task of the American region which has something very special within the Campylla task of our time. Campylla in North America, I think, has a very particular task, a particular role to play in the development of Campylla into the future. And I think it has to do with this feeling realm, with this heart realm, which is so difficult to grasp, but which needs to shine into the darkness of our time, the darknesses we find easily enough. A new path of heart thinking, we could perhaps say. Something which has to do with the connection from human being to human being, from eye to eye, the connection from heart to heart. And we can see also that this task of Kaspar Hauser, it is still the task of Kaspar Hauser, that is why he's so important in this series of pictures by 
Karl Koenig, we see in this picture of St. John, how we are asked to use our higher senses. We see the higher senses in this picture as a pathway to quite practically grasp the spirit in our daily life and make it available in our world. So we do see these three, let's call them virtues of our time. Truthfulness. Yes, if we can reach to these heights of the world word, we are reaching to this element of truthfulness. There can be no lie, no deceit at that level. And what is brought to earth from this heart being can only be truth. And this mission of love, which Caspar Hauser definitely had, that would be a, a theme for a different talk, but uh, it's, for me, it's quite clear that Caspar Hauser's mission is a mission of love. And this becomes in our time, our responsibility for social life, for the other human being. Love cannot be for me, it can't be something selfish, of course. Love is only thinkable, it's only practicable if it is for the world, for human beings around us, for our social setting. To be responsible for the other being, that is, so to speak, awakening the Christ being in me. Not I, but Christ in me, is what begins to unfold if each year we can rise to the spirit and bring something of the spirit into social life, into social reality. And what we see in this extraordinary picture that Karl Koenig drew, this tears, blue tears of Kaspar Hauser in this strange framework, that is this sacrifice that we have to bring in social life. It's on the one hand, humility, that's certainly something which Kaspar Hauser had, but at the same time, it is courage, courage to take on destiny, whatever destiny wants of us, not to hide behind outer circumstances, but to live this destiny the way we are inspired by the spirit. So all these three hmm, virtues were present during these last three days on earth for Kaspar Hauser. They played out in this house in Ansbach, which will soon be ready as a meeting house and um, a place to connect to Kaspar Hauser. On his deathbed, in these three days, we can experience these three powers that he offered to us and that we can actually search through our path on the journey through the year, every year, again and again. So that was just to tell you why I think it's something which belongs to our times now, right now, this year, 2022, 100 years after the burning of the Goethe Anum, we need to bring light into the darkness and a flame which is an inner flame and not a, a flame which burns buildings. 